One president put it this way, no one who's not had the responsibility can really understand what it's like to be the president. Not even his closest aides or members of his immediate family. There's no end to the chain that binds him. And he's never allowed to forget that he is the president of the United States of America. Over the past two centuries, 400 million people have called themselves American. Over half of them are alive today, but only 39 of them have become president. Today, the whole world is involved with this office and this man and the future of this nation. And within our system of government, that's also the responsibility of the president, who alone has as his constituency all the people of our country, and also who alone must assess the complex issues and the conflicts, both on the national scene and in the international world. In the beginning, it was different. In the beginning, nobody had the faintest idea that it would eventually stretch from sea to shining sea. In the beginning, these were called the great blue hills of God, but it was said in another language. And this was called Niagara. The land itself had been here forever, but to the people of Europe arriving in the 16th century, it was a new world. 150 years after the landing at Plymouth Rock, they fought a war for their freedom and wrote a document that set down the idea of a free people in control of their own destiny. And after the American Constitution was ratified and people started to live under it, the North American continent would never be the same again. The Constitution turned out to be one of the great political miracles of all time because it allowed people to transfer real power without killing each other. used for the transfer of that power is the presidency. And ever since 1789, somebody has come from somewhere to take on this incredible task. When a man is elected president of this great land, he becomes the president of all of it. Over the past 50 years, the American president has become an international figure seen and heard everywhere, every day. We have two great objects as set out in the Democratic platform. That's the welfare and the prosperity of the United States of America and the welfare and the prosperity of the world as a whole. And while this bill does not solve our problems in this area, I do not believe it is a valid argument to say this bill isn't going to do the job. It will not. But it will do part of it. I must and will oppose such an unsound tax proposal. I most earnestly hope that it will be rejected by the Congress. Especially, I hope, you feel the same way. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. But no president has been entirely beloved in his own time. Putting them down is one of the favorite pastimes of American politics. Of Franklin D. Roosevelt, it was said, he is a liar, a thief, a madman given to bursts of maniacal laughter, a Bolshevik. Of James Buchanan, it was said, if ever a man deserves hanging, he does. Woodrow Wilson was described as lily-livered. Of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, it was written, this is a flat, dishwatery utterance. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame when he reads this wretched, botched, unstatesmanlike paper. 
and Harry Truman's handling of the UN partition of Palestine was called unmatched for ineptitude by any administration in history. But our democracy has not survived for two centuries on negation or fury or dim-witted sarcasm. Jimmy Carter, like his predecessors, came into office because the people saw something in him that they liked, something they trusted. In spite of all the hoopla of conventions and campaigns, we take seriously the business of stepping alone into a voting booth to select one man to lead us for four years. The voter is searching for certain qualities. What are the qualities Americans search for in a president? President, first of all, has to be a person of good moral character. People can look up to him and feel a sense of respect for him as a person. I think they should be loyal. I think they should be dedicated. I expect a person to have a uh consistency. I think you have to be a little God-fearing. There's got to be a sense of humor if you're a president. He Don't needs patience. Uh, sincerity. Credibility. Moral strength. A man that cares about our country and the people of the country. When uh, Jimmy Carter came along in 1976, uh, his soft manner of speech, his tendency toward understatement as opposed to the, the general hyperbole that you hear from uh, politicians uh, like me, for instance, uh, was a welcome thing uh, to the American people. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. <laughs> I'm glad to be back here in this church. I came here as a candidate. I was received with open arms. I'm back here as president now, received again with open arms. I think to have a president who can listen and who does listen as well as talk is a refreshing change of pace. We're not the first ones who face difficult times. We're not the first ones that sought for full freedom. We're not the first ones that sought to find a promised land. We're making progress down the road together, but I don't claim that we've yet reached the promised land. He's deliberately opted for, uh, very appropriately, I think, for a style which says, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, the complexity, the reality, the frustrations, uh, the victories, and the defeats. Uh, and we're going to uh, get the process off the stage and into the reality of daily life. In order to be a, a good and an effective president, an individual has to be honest, intelligent. One that sounds like he's not just giving you a line. So an advocate of civil rights. Concerned about cities and towns. Concerned for working men. Concerned for the people and for their problems. Knowledgeable about the arena in order to get something done. Someone that's actually interested in what the people feel even after he's elected and not just trying to get him into the White House. They not only have to be sincere, but they have to be able to, to accomplish something with their sincerity. No one in history has been better to senior citizens. He saved the Social Security system. He gave more money to education than any uh, president in history. He saved New York City and New York State. Uh, he uh, revamped the civil service system. He deregulated airlines. But there are those out there that have you think that the Congress accomplished nothing of the Carter legislation. Truth is that we've passed about 80% of all the programs that the president has sent up. Uh, he's dealing with the pent-up problems of our economy and, and inflation and the, uh, the decline in the growth of American productivity. These are not problems that are created overnight by a president. They are long-term problems that come into being and have to be addressed. I think one of the outstanding records of uh, Carter and his administration has been in their recognition of the help that cities need and the kind of response they've given to mayors like myself. Uh, the important uh, financial assistance that we've received in order to try to create jobs and development in our cities. And while you may not solve all of the problems of the world by throwing money at them, I can assure you that you are not going to solve them if money is not available to somehow deal with these very expensive problems. It is sheer deception to promise the American people that we can have this enormously expensive and unfair tax cut that we can dramatically increase defense expenditures even above and beyond 
the substantial levels I've recommended and that we can sustain our programs in education, employment, health, and other areas, and that we can exercise budget restraint at the same time. You all know that this kind of hasty offer can only be called by one word, and that's irresponsible, and we will not stand for it. The president should be honest. He should be able to handle a lot of problems. When things come up, he should know what to do, not freeze under pressure. Someone who can really think on their feet. There's somebody who can make tough decisions. Who is willing to speak up and fight uh, for the things that uh, he believes in. Regardless of how it affects his political status. One of the qualities we in this profession admire is courage, political courage. And this president has a lot of that. He may speak softly, and he looks soft to some, but uh, he's a tough man. Now, for example, from the time of President Kennedy, everyone, every Secretary of State, every President said that something had to be done about Panama because it was a disgrace to us that we, while we were speaking of the evils of colonialism, were actually practicing this. But every President made it a point to pass it on to his successor. This President decided that the time had come to clean this page from our history books and although every political advisor told him to lay off and pass it on to his successor, he tackled that. In effect, it has saved the United States and some of our young men from having to serve in conditions of war in our Western Hemisphere for the first time because Jimmy Carter had the fortitude, the courage, and the political courage above all because he hasn't ducked any of these political issues because it's a presidential year or because it would hurt his chances for re-election. We've been talking about energy since 1952. Harry Truman, when he left us, he told us America in the 70s would have an energy crisis. Nobody did anything about it. The various presidents, the various Congress, or the people themselves. Jimmy Carter spoke to Congress and spoke of the energy problem as the moral equivalent of war. Well, there were people who scoffed at that. Some people, their tongues and cheeks, thought of it as a flight of rhetorical fancy. But as a matter of plain fact, Jimmy Carter's prophecy has almost come true. When he got low in the polls, that to me was his badge of honor. Because I knew the fact that he was low in the polls meant that he was willing to do the right thing, even if it wasn't, for the moment, the popular thing. Well, Jimmy Carter is one of these people that I call a workhorse instead of a show horse. He's good at the hard, tedious job that any executive's got to do. He's not all that good in bragging on himself or pointing out uh, the achievements. Jimmy Carter doesn't act like a politician is supposed to act up here in D.C. But this is what the people wanted. And this is what Jimmy Carter offered the people. And this is what he has given us. He has given us independence of the corrupted processes he has given us independence of the vested interests. He's stuck to his guns with a firm belief in the ability of the American people, who are decent people, to understand that while things may be tough, that nonetheless, uh, that maybe that's the road to go. And there is no question in my mind but that his tenacious persistence to bring both Mr. Begin and Mr. Sadat together was the one thing that paid the dividends. The last day at Camp David during the uh, negotiations, it was about halfway through the morning when uh, the president and I met again for umpteenth time. And he said, uh, Cy, how do you think it looks? I said, Mr. President, I think we've crossed the final hurdle. We're going to get there. And he said to me, I believe it too. I really think that we have finally achieved it. And I remember that uh, this was a moment that was thrilling to both of us because we suddenly realized that uh, we had reached an historic agreement that might change the future of the Middle East. One of the things I've noticed about President Carter is that when he gets people together, he appeals to the best instincts in each of them. Now, there are leaders, of course, and some effective. 
who appeal to the worst in each of us, the fear, the hate, the dread. Not Jimmy Carter. He appeals to uh, the hope, the faith, uh, the future. He makes each of us feel like a better person for having sat and talked with him. Uh, he never tries to get us to do something uh, because uh, the Republicans uh, or the opposition or somebody else uh, is going to criticize us if we don't. No, he talks instead about what's good for the future of the country. Not uh, necessarily uh, that it will be popular, uh, but essentially that it will be right. Time after time, his determination to run against the stream uh, and do things because they were right and because the country needed them, even when it was politically unpopular, I, I think is the kind of president and those are the kinds of qualities we need in somebody, especially approaching the 80s, uh, when there's nothing but tough issues at stake. To reach our goals is not going to be easy. It's not going to be simple. It never has. Sometimes it's required suffering. Sometimes it's required patience. It's always required courage and determination and a sense of unity and a maintenance of our degree of faith. Ours is a great country. We're all in it together. We never thought it would take this long to reach the promised land. But we are moving in the right direction. Every four years, we search for the man with every good quality imaginable. We can put him together in our minds, of course. That's not hard to do. We can always see him through the simplifying mist of memory. He would have the military genius of George Washington, the common touch of Andrew Jackson, and the determination of Grant. He would move forward into the future like Teddy Roosevelt. He would have the zest and shrewdness of FDR, the rich humor of Jack Kennedy, the feistiness of Truman, and the solidity of Ike. He would be as humane as Thomas Jefferson and as quietly persistent as Abe Lincoln. But we're not electing a statue this November. We're electing a president. And although every political advisor told him to lay off and pass it on to his successor, he tackled that. Jimmy Carter doesn't act like a politician is supposed to act. Well, Jimmy Carter is one of these people I call a workhorse instead of a show horse. He does the thing that people say can't be done. Doing the Panama. He makes each of us feel like a better person for having sat and talked with him. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening. It's now just a month before one of the most important elections we will have had in many years. I'd like to take a few minutes tonight to discuss quietly with you the choice you will be making on November 4th. It's a choice about the future of this nation. As president, I am the American official who represents all of you as I make difficult decisions here in the White House. This job has at the same time tremendous isolation, overexposure in the press, and tremendous responsibility but I've not been dazzled by the office nor exhausted by the responsibility. I'm doing the job now as an experienced and established president with a workable vision of the future. I understand your problems better today than I did four years ago. And I'm running again determined to resolve those problems so that we may all take advantage of the wonderful opportunities in our great and free land. Our commitment to freedom and justice, our shared ideals, our strong families and communities, these are the foundations of America's strength. Let me look briefly beyond day-to-day -day politics. Well, this is not simply an election between two candidates. It's an election between two American futures. In order to arrive at the best future, we must stay on the best road. And the best road is not always the smoothest one. If your confidence carries me into a second term, 
I'm prepared to keep our nation strong and at peace, to preserve the foundation of our new energy policy, to rebuild the American industrial machine, to recapture the might of our great basic industries, to move forward with research and new high technologies, and to improve the quality of American life for all of us. This work involves imaginative planning and will depend on the further development of a new nationwide cooperative attitude an attitude that is once again giving us a sense of genuine American community. As we showed in our fight for a sound energy program, we will never sidestep tough problems. And what we have already accomplished will allow us to do much more. But there are other problems that wait for us out there beyond Inauguration Day, important human problems that include not just the United States, where 5% of the world's people live, but the planet itself, where we all live all four and a half billion of us. There's always a crucial question of world peace and the vast questions of hunger and the use of land and water and energy. Complex enough in 1980, but further complicated by the fact that in the year 2000, if the present rate continues, six billion people will live on this turning earth. Most of them will be citizens of nations already impoverished. We share these common challenges and if the strongest and freest nation on earth will not address them, then who will? American food, American strength, American technological capability, and our human values will be crucial. We shall meet the challenges sensibly, just as we've worked to enhance human rights. Understanding both the uses and limits of our power, we will continue to use American ideals and influence for the benefit of all people. Eventually, Though it will take time, the land of the free can contribute to the freeing of the whole world. These are just a few of the great opportunities that lie ahead. They can be realized only by people of energy and imagination, and we are a people of energy and imagination. No election will solve everything, yet it's accurate to say that this election will point the way. I know that many of you are undecided today, even though you share my confidence and my dreams for the future. I hope that in the weeks ahead, you'll give serious consideration to which path we will take on November 4th. The future is waiting for all of us. Thank you, and good night. I'm Bob Graham, and I'd like to talk with you about Jimmy Carter. I supported him in 1976, and I'm solidly for him today. Florida has faced more than its share of crises during the last two years. In each one, we've had a friend in President Carter. No matter how rough the road, Jimmy Carter has never been afraid to take it. I like that. I'm going to vote for him on November the 4th. I hope you will join me.